Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, and welcome to worship here on this sixth Sunday following Epiphany at St. Paul's United Church of Christ in German Township. We're delighted to have you with us, and happy Valentine's Day to each and every one of you. Here are the words to our call to worship this morning. O Lord our God, we cry out to you, and you restore our health. Our healer washes us in the waters of baptism, cleanses us from all that enslaves us, and gives us peace. Lord our God, we will give you thanks forever. Please join me now in our opening prayer. Give us ears, O God, to hear your word beyond our own expectations. Let your Holy Spirit infuse us with insight in the light of your continued epiphany in our midst. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Our opening hymn this morning is, In Christ There Is No East or West. Please join us by singing. Now living in the light of Christ, who reveals both our lives and God's abundant love, let us pray for the church, those in need, and all of God's creation. Please pray with me now. God of new life, you renew us daily through your baptismal promise. Guide us in all we do, that your power will shine through our words and deeds. We pray for the earth, for the health of all bodies of water, for the beautiful Ohio and Wabash rivers, and for all other rivers and streams and lakes, that in the clear, clean waters that you've created for us to drink and use, we may see your love for all your creatures. For all who live directly by the bounty of the earth, for those who sow seeds, raise livestock, catch fish, for those who work in processing plants, who manufacture farm implements, and for people who pack and haul and sell their vegetables, fruit, and meats, bless them in their labor for the sake of all who depend on them for food. We pray for essential workers who stock grocery shelves, fill our prescriptions, treat our illness, respond to our needs in time of emergency, who teach our children and our young adults, and who operate the great machinery of government. We pray for their safety, for their energy, and for their inspiration. For all governments, city councils, county commissioners, mayors, and all who vote, give wisdom to our people to serve the needs of everyone. We pray for children throughout the world, for good schools and compassionate teachers, for healthy homes, for clothing, food, clean water, and shelter enough that they can thrive and grow. For friends and neighbors, aunts and uncles, grandparents and parents who watch over little ones. 
that their joy in this world would be complete. For all people who are in distress, for those who are hurting, for those who worry, for those who are sick, for those in need of a friend, for all on the prayer list of this congregation, for all the names that are known only to you, grant them your help. We remember with grateful affection the witness of the saints who have helped us form our faith, and we give you thanks for them. And into your hands, gracious God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your divine providence and wisdom. And we ask all this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our scripture lesson this morning is from Paul's letter to the Church of Corinth, 1 Corinthians, the ninth chapter, beginning with the 24th verse. It's a short passage. Do you not know that in a race the runners all compete, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may win it. Athletes exercise self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath but we an imperishable one. So I do not run aimlessly, nor do I box as though beating the air, but I punish my body and enslave it, so that after proclaiming to others, I myself should not be disqualified. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Since this is the second part of a two-part sermon series, I probably ought to start by doing what they do on television, so I will. Here's the first bit. Previously on sermons from St. Paul's, we talked about the difference between natural religion and revealed religion, those being terms that were coined by Thomas Aquinas many, many centuries ago, used to explain that there are certain aspects of nature that point in the direction of the reality of God natural religion, but there, is also, there are also aspects of religion that have to be taught, that are revealed through scripture, revealed religion. And we talked about how while natural religion, forces of nature, etc., would perhaps create a sense in us that there is a God out there, we really need the help of revealed religion in order to fully understand the majesty of who God is, at least to the extent that humans can grasp the concept. We also talked about last time the fact that the church, and this church in particular, but the same is true of all other churches, is called to be the voice of that revealed religion in the world. And we talked about the fact that to sit around and assume that everybody knows about God and that everybody knows about Jesus is simply not in keeping with the reality that we experience in the world. The church is still called to do many things, to be the hands and feet of God in the world, but also to be the beacon of God in the world, to teach about God as we understand God through the reality of scripture, through the life of Jesus Christ, and to communicate that information to the rest of the world. So that's where we got to last week. And I did end that sermon, I believe, by saying that if the, we want the world to tr take the church seriously, we need to take ourselves seriously and rethink about how we think about church give it a, an additional thought, to understand the vital importance of the church in the world for perpetuating the good news of Jesus Christ. So if you want to go back and see that sermon, if you didn't catch it, it's on our YouTube channel. I commend you to do it. You can stop this right here now if you want to and go back and see it. But I think you're pretty well caught up to date with my little recap here this morning. 
Well, the scripture lesson that we heard this morning from Paul gives us a very clear set of analogies based on athletics. Paul talking about all the things that athletes will do to prepare themselves for the task ahead so that they might strive to win a prize. Now, like all analogies that we use in preaching and teaching, they can only take that so far before it starts getting a little well, questionable on how far or how accurate it can be. You could read Paul's scripture this morning as saying that we can somehow through our own efforts work out our own salvation. But I think really what he's saying is there are things we need to do to meet God so that God can save us. And that perhaps is a theological discussion for another Sunday morning. But the image I want to pick up on is that last little bit of scripture that we talked about or we heard this morning, where Paul's talking about the fact that he doesn't just punch in the air like a boxer, he actually strikes home in order to, well, hone his athletic prowess that was so important to the church in Corinth uh, because they did have games there uh, every year that were similar to the Olympics, but not exactly the same. Paul says, I don't punch in the air, or the way I'm paraphrasing it this morning, I don't just flail away at that which I'm trying to achieve. I think flailing is a interesting word as a verb. To flail away at something conjures up certain mental images, but they go back to a very specific image, and that is of a medieval weapon that is a flail. And the flail is a large weight, frequently spiked or otherwise uh, enhanced that's at the end of a chain or a cord attached to a handle and the way that weapon was used was to simply swing it around and see what you might hit to be sure people would want to stay back from the person flailing away but from an accuracy standpoint you might connect you might not and if you did connect you might not connect in the way that you wanted to in fact you might accidentally hit one of your fellow soldiers with it it wouldn't be too surprising because it was a very inexact weapon. Flailing away. When I think about that, I'm also called back to a movie image. If you've seen the movie Braveheart, I've watched it three or four times, although not recently, there is a battle scene in that movie where the characters are speaking together in the foreground with the idea that the battle is winding down in the background. And right smack dab in the middle of that scene, there are two extras in the background who have been told, look like you're fighting. And they are literally taking their swords and going tap, 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 tap with about as much enthusiasm as, well, somebody who's probably been standing around in the heat all day wearing a big costume. Certainly not very effective there, flailing away. Maybe you hit, maybe you don't, but it's not necessarily all that effective. What I think Paul was calling us to consider today in the church as we think about what we want our church to be, is the necessity to be deliberate and to concentrate and to design what we do to maximize our effectiveness as God's witness in the world here on this corner of the highway in Saint, at St. Saint Paul's here in German Township. We are a beacon. But how can we do it better? Well, as I said before in last Sunday's sermon, we're now at the end of ordinary time, and on Wednesday of this coming week, we will start Lent. And once we get into the Lenten season, starting with Ash Wednesday, and I hope you'll join us for that service that will be in your inbox on late Wednesday afternoon, as we begin the time of Lent, we are going to take a spiritual journey together. And I don't want to detract from that by talking about some nuts and bolts so here at the end of Ordinary Time, I want to give us some specific things to think about as we go through Lent and then pop out on the other side as we begin our worship outdoors together in the parking lot and soon after Easter get to our annual meeting where we will make decisions about the future of St. Paul's Church and how it may impact our local community. So here are some thoughts some ideas for you to ponder. And I'll be the first to acknowledge they don't necessarily all flow together all that neatly, 
But I think they're worth saying and in keeping with our theme. You have been generous in sharing ideas about St. Paul's Church and what could be done to make it stronger or to take it in new or different directions. And one of the ways those conversations always start out is, I think we should, and then fill in the blank. And I think it's important that we use our imagination to think about new ways that we could do church together to be more effective. But I want to make two comments about that short sentence. And first, I want to lengthen the sentence. I think we should do blank, should always be completed with, and therefore I will do blank to get it started. Let me say it again. As we go forward, let's commit to say, when we say, I think we should do blank, let us individually be ready to finish that sentence with, and I will do blank to get it started. We are very good about thinking about what others could do in the church or should do or used to do or whatever, we're a little more reluctant to commit to how we will help bring about the change that we are wanting to see. I think we should have more young people in Sunday school. So I will agree to teach a class. I think we should have more young families in the church. So I will agree to contact those young families who are already on the books and make a deliberate effort to invite them to be here. You can posit other blanks and other ways you might fill them in, but let's commit to be deliberate, each and every one of us, to contributing to what it is that we want this church to become or to become better at, as the case might be. The other thing I want to say about that very commonly expressed thought is not to, first of all, uh, discourage you from having those because blue sky is where it all starts and we work from there. Your ideas are welcome and needed, as many perspectives as we can get. But another way that sentence frequently rolls out is we need to do blank because we used to do it so well and then comes the story about the past. Now, I think I have credibility with you to say that I am a big fan of the history of St. Paul's 180 years plus of service in this place, and I always am interested in learning something more about our history and communicating that to you when I discover it myself. And we certainly had a lot of history in our 175th anniversary celebration a few years ago, and we'll continue to celebrate service here and recognize the accomplishments of the past. But while the past is sometimes useful to teach us a new lesson, it really probably doesn't tell us much about where we need to go into the future. Because past circumstances and past days are exactly that. Nor should we sit around mourning the fact that they are past to blind us to what we might do with the present and the opportunities that are presented there. Now, these challenges are difficult. We tend to go to the things we know which come out of the past, and we tend not to be all that great at predicting where the future is going to go, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't try to do that. And one of the areas that we struggle with here at St. Paul's, as with many other churches, is attracting young families and children to our programming. And we ought to just be honest about that and not put our head in the sand about it at all, it's not because we don't try. Jessica and others are constantly trying to do new things to reach children in our community, and we are successful in things like Vacation Bible School, attracting people to the, to the church. But as we think about what we might continue to do to improve on that, we need to understand how fast things are moving in today's society. If we are going to focus primarily on the things that we enjoyed when we were young, a good chance that that approach is going to be out of touch. And it's actually worse than that. If we want to concentrate on the things our children enjoyed when they were young, well, that ship may have sailed already. 
And it's very difficult to figure out how to meet the needs of younger generations using some of the traditional ways that we have done church. Now, technology might be part of the answer, and we can talk about that and whether we need to improve our technology here that we offer through St. Paul's. But we also need to realize that we may have to deliver church, if you can think of it that way, in different places, through different ways, and rethink how we define our St. Paul's community and our St. Paul's family. Now, I'm not here this morning to give answers to these issues, but I do encourage you to give it some thought as we try to decide where St. Paul's should go in the future. We are presented with exciting challenges, although they're not all happy challenges, but just the way we have learned to do things differently here at St. Paul's during this time of pandemic, I think underscores the fact that we can be, when we have to be, quite flexible and still meet the mandate of what we are called to do. We have had an increase in online giving. I'm not here to sell that as something that's appropriate for everyone, but it is a way to tap into receiving offerings that to many young people make more sense when they're used to paying bills using their cell phone and the like. We have learned, and you've suffered through a lot of this, how to use video technology to reach out to the larger community. And many of you who are watching this today are likely not to have been St. Paul's members or part of our family, and I know a few of you have never been in the building. We are grateful that we have had this opportunity and continue to have here in the future to reach out to you where you might be and invite you to be part of us. And we certainly have, as this has gone on, found other ways to incorporate music and pictures and those sorts of things to enhance our worship experience. And we can take those lessons and bring them back into the sanctuary when it becomes safe to do that if our collective judgment is that that will make us more effective in the way that we communicate the gospel and more effective in bringing about amongst our people a worshipful feeling and experience when they gather for worship. Now I don't have a lot of answers up my sleeve here this morning. But I do think if we are focused on being evangelistic in what we do, we will be a healthier church. Now, I want to be very clear that we're not using the political definitions of who's an evangelical and who's not. I'm simply talking about the call to the church and being faithful to that call of telling the story of the good news and trying to figure out creative ways to be like Paul, all things to all people, with the hope that we can win them over to Christ and through Christ to God in ways that will deepen their faith, deepen their spiritual relationship, and strengthen the work of the church in the world. I do have to add one more note of caution. As we think about the things we can do, we need to understand the appropriate role of fellowship activities. Fellowship within the body here at St. Paul's is great for building up relationships, and that is what we should all be about. Fellowship opportunities are a great opportunity to open a door for people to join in with us that might not otherwise be open. And we have talked before about how intimidating it is if you are, if you've never been churched to ever set foot into one because you don't know what to expect. And if you think I'm overstating it, think about the last time you went into another church where you didn't know anyone before you went in the door, even though you are church people. And I have to ask you to reflect, wasn't that a little bit uncomfortable and a little bit of something you aren't inclined to do too often again? 
fellowship has its place. But fellowship is not evangelism. It is great that we do things like trunk or treat to get to know people better. But if we don't take our fellowship opportunities to the next step by greeting, inviting, thanking, and following up, gift, if you didn't catch what I was doing there, and to begin the delicate an intentional process of offering the gospel message to those with whom we interact, then we are not going all the way to meet the mandate that we have been given to make disciples of all people, to tell the world about the good news of Jesus Christ, to be the beacon in the midst of a dark and unknowing world. Well, that's a lot to dump on you on a Sunday morning. And those are things to think about over the many next, or the next many weeks, I should say, that are ahead of us between now and when we get to the annual meeting and beyond. And we do not know as we stand here today and worship together today what the pandemic is going to do or allow us to do. We can't see the future that clearly. But we are call, called to be bold we are called to be faithful. We are called to be intentional. And I encourage all of us together to do that for the strengthening and health of St. Paul's Church, but more importantly, for the glory of God. Amen. It is appropriate now that we dedicate the tithes and offerings received by this church in the previous week to the work of the kingdom through this church here at St. Paul's. Please join me in that prayer. For gifts that live all around us in creation, O oh God, we give you thanks. For your gifts that come from the servanthood of your Son, O oh God, we give you praise. For the gifts that arise in our daily lives through the work of your Holy Spirit, O oh God, we give you thanks. Make these gifts that we have brought to you flourish on earth to your glory. Amen. closing hymn this morning is How Great Thou Art.
As you depart here today, remember that God's blessings attend you this and every day. You are not alone, so go from this place in peace. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen.